Welcome to another episode of our personal empowerment audio program, Finding Yourself in Paradise. Hi, I'm Michael Benner. And I'm Steve Snyder. And our program today is entitled Greed, Sloth, and Narcissism. Not exactly your breakfast table conversation, but Michael and I are sort of reprising a show we did quite a while back called Dealing with Difficult People, where we talked about negative people and angry people and people who are sad or depressed and how hard it is to deal with those sorts of people. And we were sort of having a conversation about what other kinds of people are difficult to deal with. And we came up with greedy people, slothful, lazy, unmotivated, uninspired people, and, you know, really arrogant, narcissistic, entitled kind of people. I'd like to start with an argument that maybe we don't even need to make here, but I'm going to anyway. And that's the idea that we're not being manipulative when we think about the best ways to deal with these kinds of people. Manipulative is, I don't know, I think that that's trying to manipulate another person for your own selfish benefit. And we find that in some of the people we're talking about here. But this is simple responsibility for your relationships. You know, Daniel Goleman's classic on emotional intelligence is broken into four areas, and the order is important, too. It's self-awareness and then self-management of your emotional nature, and then three, empathy, and four, relationship management. So once you become aware of your own feelings and then are able to manage them, in the same way you can then begin to empathize and manage those relationships. We all have relationships. We're social creatures. There are always going to be people in our lives, people that live alone and end up alone, even if they say that's what they want and pretend they're happy. There's something missing. We're social creatures. And since you're going to connect, and there's already 6 billion people on this planet... Let's talk about the best way to deal with difficult people or people that just drive you crazy. Of course, sometimes it's best to disengage whenever possible. Sometimes you don't want to deal with these kinds of people at all, but sometimes you have to. And so it's like important to have a strategy in mind, you know, like instead of being stumped, like, how do I deal with this behavior? Just a general idea of how you deal with difficult people. We talked in the first show in, in dealing with difficult people about dealing with uh, negative people, pessimistic negative people. What do you do when you come across somebody who's saying, oh, it'll never work. This this is a terrible idea. We tried that before. All those lines about it's going to fail. And of course, you know that they would be able to create that failure with self-fulfilling prophecy. If somebody believes it's going to fail, then somehow they'll find a way to make it fail. You can always find a way to make something fail. So so how do you deal with people who have that negative attitude? Well, you know, disengage whenever possible, but when you have to interact, then find something to agree with them on, you know. Well, disengage by, like, not being in an argumentative mode with them, saying, yeah, you know, one of the things you were saying, I absolutely agree with that. Then they don't want to argue with you anymore. You're no fun. You're agreeing with them. They want somebody that they can bounce off, fight against. So, so with negative people, People find something to agree with. You know, when you're dealing with uh, sad and depressed people, it's more about getting them out of their own selves and letting them do something else. Well, who isn't sad and depressed sometimes? A depression is a particularly difficult negative emotion, I think, because it tends to carry with it a sense that it's never going to go away, right? And you can even reason with your depression and say, yeah, well... You said that last time and you went away after a couple of days, all the blues disappeared, the melancholia vaporized. I felt really, really great. So there. And depression answers, yeah, but it's different this time. I'm here to <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm just maybe this is just my personal experience, but to deal with your own depression and your own sadness is one thing, but to understand that Sad and depressed people tend to bring you down. There is a contagion, you know. In the 60s, we talked about the vibes. Well, you can feel that. There are in the world sappers and zappers. And the zappers are people that bring their energy into a room and, and add to the conversation and the overall enthusiasm of what's happening. And when they go, everybody's energized. But the sappers, they come in vampire-like with their depression and their sadness, and they want to pull upon your vitality, right? So you have to, first of all, be aware of that. You have to 
see it in yourself, your own sadness and your own periods of depression and the games your brain or mind played with you at the time so that you can empathize, recognize that in other people, and then begin to account for their sadness and depression. Now, you could try to reason with a depressed person, but you're going to be met with a lot of resistance. Maybe the best way that Steve and I know to redirect the energies of a sad or depressed person is to put them on to helping somebody else, to making some kind of contribution, especially something that you know that your depressed friend is really good at and on their better days really excels in this area because they really love it. And who would benefit from that and put them in that direction? Yeah, the best way to deal with a sad or depressed person is to get them out of their own head and into helping others. You know, it's just a wonderful gift that you can give them. And then, of course, the third we talked about was dealing with angry people, you know, dealing with people who have uh, lots of pent up frustration or lots of anger and they've got all this negative, angry energy coming at you. How do you deal with angry people? Well, it's almost like. With a dog, you know, when they sense somebody who is afraid of them, the, the anger gets stronger. The, the secret to dealing with angry people is to show no fear, is to feel fear-free, to feel fearless. Because angry people are trying to scare you, and, and they want you to step back, and they want you to be afraid of them. That's what the anger is about, is to scare you. And if you, you don't come forward, you don't want to attack anger with anger, but nor do you want to step back with fear. If you just stand your ground fearlessly, then their anger has a chance to dissipate and won't affect you and won't be bounced back and accelerated. Their, their anger needs somebody to be a mirror to bounce anger back at them. So they get angry at you, so you'll get angry back so they can get angrier. But if you don't get angry back, they can't get any angrier. The whole idea that you're Anger has to be directed at someone or something. That it's not enough just to be angry. You have to be angry at <laughs> so-and-so. You don't have that quality in all emotions. Although there is a tendency with negative emotions to play victim, to be the helpless effect of the feeling, rather than seeing it as being evoked from you. But I think another area of insight with anger, first in yourself and then you can empathize and see it in other people, is to find the hurt in the anger, to realize that anger is hurt that's been tolerated again and again, some sort of uh, injustice or extreme frustration that gets repeated over and over again but never expressed or resolved in any kind of way. And that finally builds to the point of explosion, often violence. That's why, you know, anger can be very, right at the top of the negative emotions, anger. It's, it's one of the most likely emotions to trigger violence. And to understand that it's just hurt, to find the hurt. Where were you hurt? Who hurt you? You can't talk to an angry person like that. Well, who hurt you? Uh, Unless you're some sort of therapist, or it depends on the situation, right? If they're writing you checks, you could maybe ask a question like that. But in public, it helps you to empathize, to sympathize with the fact that we're all hurt. We, we've all been hurt repeatedly. We've been lied to. We've been cheated upon. We've been betrayed. We, we, we live in a world where the, the injustices are so gross that we turn our eyes away and refuse to even look at how much that hurts. And I think that's a great way to deal with anger in other people, is to recognize, look for the hurt. And that will take you quickly to compassion. I mean, all of these feelings that we've talked about in this past show and just reviewed for you now, and the next three we're about to explore, are all rooted in fear, and the antidote is all compassion, one of the highest qualities of love imaginable. And it comes from knowing that we're sharing the same game here, the same tragedy, the same drama, the same comedy. It's uh, sometimes wonderful and sometimes horrible, but we're all going through it. It is, and you're going to deal with people of all of these ilks at one time or another in your life. So remember, when you're dealing with negative people, Find something to agree with. Take them a little off balance when you're dealing with angry people. Show no fear. Be fearless. And when you're dealing with sad or lonely or really unhappy people, then help them get out of themselves and help them help 
someone else. And now, of course, we want to break into our, our new areas that we were brainstorming about, and that is the idea of greed, sloth, and narcissism. Greed, sloth, and narcissism. Dealing with people who are greedy, dealing with people who are lazy, slothful, uninspired, and dealing with people who are arrogant and conceited and just so self-absorbed they don't really care about anything but themselves. Whether we say all of these negative feelings or personality types even are rooted in fear, greed is a perfect example. To see the fear in greed, that's a real important step, but it's not a big leap. All right, maybe it didn't occur to you, or maybe you haven't really thought deeply about it. But to think of greedy people as ultimately frightened people, doesn't that bring them down a notch? Like, you think of the the bankers, the gross injustices in, in oil companies making billions in profits and paying no taxes whatsoever because they registered in the Cayman Islands. You think of the injustices that are rooted in greed and it's very easy for the anger to come up in you. And now it's your problem. We just talked about anger. Well, breathe, let it go, and look at this greed as a manifestation of this person's fear. That'll help you understand it. I think that's a very important first step. Yeah, and when you look at greed, it's it sort of always comes out of a sort of selfish uh, uh, me over you attitude is like this is mine you can't have it not wanting to share i think i think you see greed in little children oft times when they don't want to share their toys when they don't want to play with their little younger siblings you know that, that this is uh something that's often found in in uh, the animal kingdom as well i had uh, these two golden retrievers and if there were two bones one dog wanted both of them you know i mean it's it's not an unusual trait to find but i think it's rooted out of the fear of scarcity the fear of I, I don't know if there's ever going to be another bone. You know, if I knew there was always going to be bones, I think, you know, then I wouldn't worry so much. But because I'm afraid, so many people who went through the depression and that era of depression thinking of, you know, hold on to everything and, and don't, you know, once you get a job, don't ever lose it. And that whole idea, that whole fear-based thing created people being afraid to be greedy. But it also created people who started to find success becoming more and more inquisitive, more and more hungry for more stuff, more things, and more power because they never let go of that. It might all be taken away from me one day. There's always underneath that greedy thing a fear of losing it all. And so greed is obviously rooted in materialism. Now, if you're oriented that way, if you live in the West, it's very likely you're oriented toward materialism. Is a complicated issue to discuss because, as I believe it's a Sufi saying, we do live in the world, but not necessarily of the world. So we can find an appropriate place for material things in our lives. I like nice stuff. I think everybody's car should start when you turn the key, right? And that the roof shouldn't leak, and you should be warm and attractive in your clothing, and Eat good food. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's a means to a quality of life. It's not the end. And greedy people seem to be confused. They think the material stuff is the goal or the destination. Yeah, I mean, you know it's greedy when you don't know when enough is enough. You know, like there's got to be more and there's got to be When enough is enough... And when it comes to stuff, it's easy to see when enough is enough. More doesn't make you any happier if you've got enough. But when it comes to aspiring, then maybe enough is never enough. Maybe there's no greediness if you're aspiring to become more compassionate or more intelligent or, or more giving. There's, there's no greedy in wanting to become more and more loving, more and more whole. The greed, I think, comes in the fear of losing everything and so wanting to have more and more and more and more stuff. And when it comes to stuff, I'm a big fan of stuff too, but there is a point when enough is enough and the rest is just because of, you know, some kind of hubris. You know, there is a certain amount of self-preservation in some greed, you know, in wanting to have enough nuts squirreled away for the winter. You know, it's it's not a black or white issue, this thing about greed. But when you don't know when enough is enough and you cannot define that and there is no enough, like more is better always, then you know you've crossed the line and you're dealing with an excessive amount of greed. I think there is a vicious cycle in there. And it comes from realizing but not being willing to admit that you realize that material things are ultimately not fulfilling. 
that the rush of buying it is incredibly exciting. Just like multitasking creates this impression that, wow, I'm really getting a lot of stuff done. I'm being so productive. I got this adrenaline racing through my system. You know, it really feels like excitement. Except the body is often impressed with that very situation as fear and anxiety. It debilitates us. What we may be addicted to and think of as exciting is actually tearing us down and confusing us. But to realize that material things, fun though they may be, in and of themselves don't fulfill you is scary. And yet you tell yourself, well, maybe I just need more of it, that's all. I'll redouble my efforts, i got to make some more money. Maybe I need to know a few more powerful and influential people. I need to elevate my status in the community somehow, and then if I just had a little more of these things, maybe then I could finally feel like I had attained something. And those people who never find that moment, you know, definitely become greedier and greedier. There is no end. And how do you deal with greedy people like that? Well, first of all, understand that they're looking from a fear place of getting some of yours. You know, they want to get some of other people's stuff so they have more for themselves. So uh, Robert Heinlein had a wonderful line. He said, always cut the cards. You know, you may still get cheated, but your odds are better, you know. So always, always, like, read the fine print with greedy people. Always, like, double check and proofread and make sure uh, about going into business this with them or doing, you know, understand they're not looking for this to come out even. They're looking for them to come out ahead. Yeah, we're presuming that because you're listening to this program and this series, Finding Yourself in Paradise, that your priorities, your values are very different than those of a greedy person. That is, Steve and I have already admitted we like material things, but you put them into your life in a balanced way. You don't love them or get addicted to them. Uh, the Christian ethic of store your riches in heaven rather than on earth where moth and dust doth corrupt. I think that's a great line. So just put it in its place. When you go buy the new car, remind yourself as you drive off the lot that somebody is going to push a shopping cart into it. It's going to happen. You can you can count on it. So, greedy person, cut yourself some slack. Give yourself a break. And when we see this in other people, let's learn to let go of this idea that what really satisfies us is more stuff. What really satisfies us is being aware of the particular moment and the joy and the happiness that comes from just watching the majesty of the moment. Again, that our basic survival needs are met by material things, I'll be the first to acknowledge those needs. That's not at all greedy. To want everything you need and a lot of the stuff that you want is not greedy. Greedy is where you want it all and you're not willing to share any of it with anybody else. So that's a that's a sickness. And I think, I think honestly, if the top 1% of the most wealthiest people in the world were more interested in helping the, the bottom 1% move up to the top 2% kind of thing than they were becoming the top half of a percent, then that would change the world in many ways. And let me say that Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are already some, doing yeah, that. Some yeah. people are doing yeah. that. And imagine the gratification, the satisfaction. Now, there is some fulfillment. Oh, man, next to being in love, giving, and helping others is, I think, the second greatest feeling in the world. Now, the second topic we're going to talk about today is the slothful, lazy person. And this can be particularly disturbing. Again, all of these negatives tend to add to any self-criticism you might be carrying anyway. So if you have someone in your family or you work with somebody who is just lazy... Let's see what we can understand about that so that it doesn't drive you crazy. First of all, what does it say about their self-esteem? Is this just somebody who believes they're somehow entitled to a free ride? Or is this a person who has elements of wanting to succeed but having failed so much in his or her life or believing that they have failed? Maybe they just had really critical parenting, right? or an older brother or sister that incessantly picked on them and 
and, and needled them. To look at the question of what is their self-esteem? Do they believe in themselves? I think that's a good place to begin your examination. Yeah, and if you look there, what you'll discover is that these people haven't looked there. That That is, people who have that low self-esteem have not looked at the cause of it, have not done the introspection because they're afraid, they're terrified probably more likely, that the closer they look, the worse they'll look. The closer they explore inside of themselves, the more they'll find that they're even worse than they thought they were. So people who are lazy, people who have low self-esteem, I think... You know, it starts from the place of being unwilling to inspect oneself. The unexamined life, so to speak, doesn't feel worth living. So they get unmotivated and uninspired. By not doing that, they also don't have a chance to see if they have any gifts, talents, or abilities they've yet to discover. They don't look for those things. They don't see ways that they could have joy and fun. What they're doing is creating this uh, sort of loop thinking of uh, bad thoughts are happening, so it feels bad. And because it feels bad, bad thoughts are happening, and it's just this loop of of negative thinking, and, and I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, and what's the use in even trying? If we work, for example, with somebody that we see as basically lazy, and they're always trying to put off their extra work onto you, and you just feel, you just cannot escape the feeling that this person is refusing consciously to carry their fair share of the load. There is a way to bring it up. You can point it out. You just have to be clever about it. Instead of, as you might consider, confronting them and saying directly, I think you're sloughing off here. I don't think you're carrying your share of the load. Ask them for help with something. Flatter them. Hey, Bill, I need I need your help with something over here. You're smart enough to figure out some way to do that. And that'll create a relationship that you can use, right, to make it more fun and enjoyable for this guy to make a contribution. You're giving him a little reward, a little a little taste of the carrot here. This is what it could be like if you recognize that we all got to chop wood and carry water. That's the old Buddhist saying, right? The Zen Kon is chop wood, carry water. It's like um, another version of that is... Uh, First the dirty laundry, then enlightenment. Or maybe it's the other way around. <laughs> First enlightenment, then the dirty laundry. Yeah, as I think about it. But you still got to go do the dirty laundry, right? You got to chop wood, carry water. There's some stuff we just got to do. So if you're dealing with people like you're the supervisor of that are slothful, whether you're the parent or the, the boss or supervisor, when you're dealing with lazy, unmotivated people, what what do you do? You know, Well, first of all, if you're the boss, you do have the option of firing, which is not a bad idea. If if they're lazy because they don't believe in your mission, they don't believe in what your company is all about, and they haven't grabbed that mission and taken it as part of their own and really feel like part of the team making that mission happen, those are the kind of people you want to let go of. If it's that they can't do that, you can help them do that. If it's that they don't choose to do that, they choose to just see this as a nine-to-five, clock-in, clock-out, they don't have to put their heart into it kind of thing, then it serves you to let those kind of people go. They, they bring down the whole team. But when you have someone like that who just doesn't doesn't know how to be motivated, then the answer, of course, is to discover what the reward for them is. What's their hot button? What makes them feel good? What What do they want? You know, what do they want? So it's, for some people, it's more money. For most people, it's not. Most people, it's more like recognition of some sort or something intrinsic within themselves, feeling like more capable or or stronger, or happier, whatever. whatever it is. Find out what that is, and you can by by having conversations with them and show them that by doing more or better, or faster, or whatever it is that you want them to do, by doing that, then they can achieve this thing, get them to dream. It's got to start with the dream. If they don't have the dream, they'll never be inspired. You don't get inspired by continuing to do the same thing you've been doing before. You get inspired by something new being added to the mix. So so help them find a dream. Uh, Interest doesn't come from what you're doing. Interest comes from the past or the future. You're interested in something because something happened to make you think this is going to be feel good, or more in in this case, you're interested because you imagine by doing this, something that wonderful is going to happen as a result. And thirdly, today we want to talk about the narcissist. You know, a lot of years went by in my involvement in psychology, and philosophy, and personal development before I really was exposed to narcissism. Because these individuals, and this is an actual 
a bona fide personality disorder in the DSM, the DSM-4, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. You can look up narcissist as part of a cluster of six personality disorders. But these people don't come for personal development because they're already perfect. These people don't come to therapy and ask you to help them manage their anxiety because whatever problems they have, they know they're not their problem. It's somebody else's problem. Couldn't possibly be me. And narcissism is less about just arrogance and entitlement and thinking you're superior. Freud chose the term based on that old Greek myth about Narcissus falling in love with his image in the pool. Well, it wasn't that he fell in love with himself or his ego or aren't I cool, but it's about falling in love with the appearance of things. And so most fundamentally, a narcissist is somebody who always fakes it. Everything is a Hollywood show. And they believe that's reality, and everybody else is doing the same thing. Everybody's making it up. Everybody lies. Everybody cheats. Everybody creates an appearance. Genuine? Are you kidding me? Sincere? Honest? There are no such things. You're all faking it. I'm just better than the rest of you at it. Yeah, and, you know, there are quite a few people like this, and many of them rise to power. You know, many of them find a way to step on other people in a way to get what they want. And you find a lot of them. Now, not most of CEOs are narcissists, but there are a lot of narcissists who are CEOs. There are a lot of narcissists who are politicians. There are a lot of narcissists who are in uh, major religious roles. You know, there are a lot of narcissists who moved into power in every area of our lives. And the way that you can tell they're a narcissist is because they're always right. You know, they're just, they're always right. This doesn't matter. And of course, people who work with narcissists who have a narcissistic boss, they've learned if they have worked with them for a while, they've learned that there's really only one way to get things done around here. And that is to get the boss to think that your idea was their idea, you know, find a way to get the boss to think it was their own, the boss's idea, then they like it. They only like their own ideas. So we can manage narcissists. We can find a way to feed their ego, to, you know, to give them the compliments they want and to, you know, let them, because they usually seem to have amazing talent in one particular area, you know, but I think it's because they're so focused, so self-centered, you know, so unconcerned about anybody else's welfare that they're totally focused on this success thing or whatever it is that it is they want to create. So we can find a way to work with them, but understand that, that, as long as you're useful to them, as long as you're helpful, as long as you're supportive of them, they'll be fine. But if if you stop being that, th- there's really not a whole lot of conscience about letting you go or getting you out of the way. Narcissists, like a number of other of the DSM's personality disorders, again, this isn't mental illness so much. This is just a particular personality trait that people have. We're not really sure why. Looks like early childhood trauma does have something to do with it, Uh, but there also may be a genetic predisposition. The DSM isn't clear. Though, by the way, I heard there's a DSM-5 coming out. They only do this about every decade, so... Yeah, I don't think personality would be genetic, because identical twins have different personalities, but... You know, but certainly early childhood, probably very early childhood, having a lot to do with the bonding and the and the feeling connected to, to somebody, I think, has a lot to do with it. Most likely. In any event, they tend to have high anxiety. And we often see OCD, obsessive compulsive disorders, in narcissists. Part of their anxiety is the frustration that you don't understand what is right when it's so clear to the narcissist. They get really anxious and nervous about, it ought to be obvious to you. From your point of view, this person, the narcissist, is just highly unreasonable. They're just very narrow-minded. But to the narcissist, it's like, what's wrong with you people? It's so clear. And so, again, as they accede to powers of position and authority, you're going to recognize that, you're going to have to deal with them, and and the anxiety that is part of all of that. And, And that, too, can be real contagious. You know, nervous people make you nervous. Yes, indeed. And dealing with narcissists, you have to understand that, like, when you come to them and and disagree with them, it's like they're, they don't understand what what is. It's like you came to the encyclopedia for the authority, and you came to the authority. The authority gave you the answer. Why are you arguing? It's not like there's any possibility that they're wrong, you know. And that's that's really where they're living in this place of 
I know more than you know, and I'm right, and I'm entitled to more than you are entitled to because of that. I'm there are people, and then there are you know capital P people, and I'm a capital P person. I get more. I'm entitled to more. What, where does this come from? You know, this it's a really interesting question. It it, it uh, I'm sure, as you said, has a lot to do with early childhood trauma of some sort. But but this this arrogance, this uh, conceit, this this feeling of superiority always is underlying some kind of an inferiority complex, always is lying some kind of a, I feel like um, I've got to put on this mask because if I get exposed underneath this is really not something that's pretty, you know. So somewhere deep down here is something that, that what's real you don't want to see. You know, I'm going to put this mask over it because I'm so insecure about what, what actually exists. I don't want to show anybody except what I want them to see. Another part of narcissism that we need to understand is the inability of the narcissist to empathize. Uh, They can't do it. Or even feel compassion, (laughs) really. Don't don't even understand the concept. Why would I do that? Largely because they're not feeling their own feelings. They have nothing to base the empathy upon. You turn to a narcissist and say, "You you know how that feels. And the narcissist... If they're candid, would have to admit, well, no, frankly, I don't know how it feels. Why would anybody choose to feel sad or to feel upset or to feel angry? You reason your way out of it. You just just choose to not feel that way. You 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 reject it with your mind. That's it. Discount it. Yeah, why would you choose that? Feeling is wrong. I'm right. That's right. (laughs) It's so obvious. Clear. The tragedy, again, is they really think that this is universally true, and you're the fool who just doesn't recognize that everybody's faking it. See, everybody's faking it. Why not? Appearance is everything. Well, you know, appearance is very, very important in a lot of career positions and a lot of jobs. But there are many others where it doesn't matter. To the farmer, he or she may just enjoy being outdoors and how they look or whether their hat's funny doesn't really matter very much. Uh, To somebody in the big city who's interfacing with customers, it might. But to the narcissist, It's not only important, appearance is everything, because we're all faking it. Yeah, and so in dealing with people who are faking it, you know, in in playing along with their game, you know, in in being able to reaffirm their perception of reality, you befriend them. You know, what they like are people who are intelligent and wise and that means they agree with them if you agree with me you must be intelligent and you must be wise so it's okay it's not that difficult to get along with narcissists as long as you don't you know try and convince them that they're wrong about anything so if you have to deal with them deal with them but do understand again it's not an even playing field it's like you do have compassion and you do care about how they feel and they don't really care too much about the way you feel at all so dealing with difficult people with people that drive you crazy There is actually an emerging field called relationship management. It's in this larger field of emotional intelligence that I like to give Daniel Goleman credit for in his work on emotional intelligence, emotional intelligence at work. There have been a lot of other women and men who've contributed to the field over the years, many who just didn't use the term emotional intelligence or or coin that funny little phrase EQ as a way of contrasting to IQ, a quality of intelligence. I like giving Goldman attribution for that, and this is the fourth part of his model. Again, self-awareness, and then manage that self. Now, you can empathize, step three, and practice relationship management. This isn't manipulating, as we said at the top of the show. It's learning to deal in harmony it's dressing for the weather, you know? <laughs> Whatever is appropriate. Exactly. And, and creating a sense of harmony. You know, harmony is a nice middle element between unity and diversity. Unity is we're all the same thing. We're all exactly alike. That'd be boring as hell. Everything's vanilla, right? Diversity is chaos and anarchy, and everybody believes what they want to believe, and there's no organization, and the extremes of these concepts. But in the middle is harmony where you have both. Hey, you sing the tonic, I'm going to sing a note a third above that, and then I'll slide up to the fifth, and you hold that tonic note. And so we'll be singing different notes, but it's going to sound really, really nice. We're going to work that together. Different, but still moving toward unity. That's harmony. That's that middle element. 
And I think that's really the heart and soul, the middle of relationship management. And if you put your business in this way, instead of thinking, well, in order to be successful in business, I've got to learn to get along with people, turn that around and make relationship management. Your relationships, the most important thing in your life. Make them genuine. Make them sincere. Go back, reread Dale Carnegie. He said it's so simple. Just be genuinely interested in other people. And everything flows from there. The deals, the money, the solutions to the problems in business you never thought you'd have to deal with. It all flows from who you know and how have you been treating them. So, you know, everybody has some aspects of all these negative behaviors, but essentially when you're dealing with really, really greedy people, bottom line is watch the bottom line. You know, be careful what you sign, read the fine print, and cut the cards. When you're dealing with slothful people, low-energy people, find their hot button, find something to motivate them, find something to get them excited about in the future so that they have a reason for, for being interested and for being upbeat. And if they don't want to buy into your vision or the company's vision, then do your best to let them go. And then when dealing with narcissists, you know, do understand that it can be a great ride. Just understand that they're not looking out for your side of the equation. They're only looking out for theirs. So dealing with difficult people, dealing with people that drive you crazy, having a plan, dressing for the weather, you know, have an idea ahead of time what you're going to be dealing with can be really helpful. Most people have just little bits of these things, but when you're dealing with people who have a lot of them, be prepared because, you know, life is a bumpy ride and it get really bumpy with people that drive you crazy. Let's install some of these comments. If you get in a comfortable position, hopefully now's a good time for you. In a nice chair, a soft one that you can sit up straight, but not rigid like a Dubai Ford. Just sit up nice and straight. Or the sofa over here, or a pillow, or a cross-legged on the floor. Whatever's comfortable for you. And let's begin by taking some nice, slow, deep breaths, right? Slowly inhaling, ideally through your nose if possible. Hold as you peek, just for a moment. Sense the fullness. And now exhale just as slowly. As you add to this a feeling of relaxation and a feeling of being really safe, experience muscles relaxing and unwinding. It'll allow you with each cycle of breathing to breathe a little more slowly because you are really safe, because you are feeling so Wonderfully relaxed. And as your body feels safe, with your breathing increased, and all of your worries and anxieties ceased, now your mind is free to visualize or to do it without pictures, just conceptualize a a place that feels like paradise, a peaceful place, a tranquil place, a calm, serene, and quiet place, your place, your very special place where you can unwind. Let go of tension in the body, anxiety in the emotions, and confusion in the mind. And find relaxation, peace of mind, and clarity. And find your body your emotions, and your mind. Relax and combine. And you find peace in paradise. Imagine yourself in the center of a circle. And all around you are the people with whom you have relationships. Closest to you, that first tier. Yeah, your family's there. Guy that lives next door. And uh, maybe the people you work with. And then radiating out, you see other people, some of whom you haven't seen for a while. Hey, how you doing? People from your past, radiating farther and farther. All these people, thousands of them. You're surprised at How many people you know? How many you could name? Just by looking at the face immediately. 
and imagine yourself in control of this scene, such that there is at first silence here. And you are in the center of the circle, radiating peace and love, happiness and joy. For no reason, you just feel really, really good. Like your team that you really, really love just won the championship, right? Or a girl that you really, really like, or a guy you think is attractive, has given you some feedback that's encouraging. That kind of wonderful feeling, just emanate that, radiate that effortlessly in all directions with a smile on your face and a feeling of letting go even more, feeling safer and more relaxed. And your ability to handle difficult people there in your life does increase as you continue to fill your heart and soul with this sense of inner peace. Your temper isn't triggered. Your irritation level is very high. It takes a lot to upset you, and you understand why. Because inside you feel peaceful, so nothing outside can invade. Inside you're feeling peaceful in this mental game you've played. So yes, there are irritations, yes, there are people who are hard with which to deal, but inside you keep equanimity, inside in the way you feel. You feel powerful, you feel able, you feel strong, and you feel sure that you can handle anything that comes your way. You feel powerful, and that feeling... Is pure. You know you can, and you trust that when you come upon difficult people, when you need to, you'll find when you must. With trust, it will be true. Allow that feeling to just fill you. When you need it, it will be true. And we'd like you to consider the difficult people, the ones that drive us crazy from time to time, become easier to tolerate and manage, easier to empathize with and understand through compassion by reminding ourselves that we're all sharing this human drama, the comedy, the tragedy, the highs and the lows, have a little sympathy, a little understanding for the fact that the guy that cuts you off in traffic, you know, he probably did not intend to do that. Good chance he had no idea how you feel. And maybe the last time somebody honked at you and you said, what, what, I didn't do anything. Maybe you cut them off, but it wasn't your intention. Maybe sometimes people just disagree or have different points of view. We can learn to tolerate that, to account for it, to expect it, only as we understand ourselves better. See it in ourselves first. That's the whole idea of judge not. It's about take a look at yourself, first of all. That's where you learn the lesson. Then perhaps you could recognize it in others and empathize rather than judge them as some backward way of learning about yourself. Know yourself directly. The Greeks, know thyself. Shakespeare, to thine own self be true. Lao Tzu, one who knows others is wise, but one who knows oneself is enlightened. That's your job. And then it'll be much easier to deal with difficult people. Remember that. Tell yourself that'll be easy to remember. And with that feeling that it, in fact, will be easy to remember, that your ability to deal with difficult people does increase, you hold the sense of paradise, the sense of inner peace. Take a deep breath, and as it feels comfortable for you, bring yourself back to wide awake. Back to wide awake from this place we like to call narrow awake, a place of focused concentration, amplified passionate interest, and 
Understand that just by believing your ability to deal with difficult people is stronger now than it was 10 minutes ago, it is. Just believing that makes it true. So I'm glad we did this. It's a good chance to remind you that you can go back into the archives and find the original program dealing with difficult people. We reviewed that in the early part of this program. And add it to your collection because, because again, we, we all have relationships. And you don't want to be the difficult person or the person that drives somebody else crazy either. So always make it about yourself first. Know thyself. We have a great opportunity for you to do just that. How about this for a segue, oh, Steve? Nice, nice. The Maui Retreat coming up in February of 2011. The Maui Paradise Retreat going to be happening in February, right during the Valentine's Day week. And it's going to be an amazing experience. A little time to let go of all the negativity that has built up in your life from living in the city or doing the work that you've done. But clearing out is the first part and then becoming aware of being surrounded by beauty and gorgeous, amazing things and filling up with that and then anchoring that, having that to hold on to for the rest of your life. Whenever you need a little shot of paradise, you can close your eyes, take a deep breath and bring back this feeling of feeling free of all the stresses and full of all the relaxation, all the calmness, all the wonder, all the joy. You know, it takes a little while. It's not something you can do in a couple of minutes. It takes a little while to get all that tension out of your body, all that anxiety out of your emotions, all that confusion out of your brain. But in a a couple of days of paradise, you can do that. And, And then three or four more days of filling up with beauty. Man, it's an amazing experience. Remember, we're flying in a restaurant chef to do this. Actually, two of them. A sous chef as well. You're going to get the most incredible, delicious meals, vegetarian friendly. We'll still have a little fish and chicken, I think, for people that eat those that swim and fly. But wonderful foods, three meals a day. But get this, except for the car key, which you might want to keep track of, you won't even need ID. You won't even need money. You're not going to need anything but short shirt, a broad-brimmed hat, and maybe a little bit of sunblock. But the nice thing is we have covered areas. We've got these two big yurts. They're about 800 square feet each. We can be inside one if we need. Both have big decks that are covered. And then 70 acres on the ocean with the whales going by, because it's going to be February. It's the best time of the year for whales. Uh, February and March are the very best time of the year. It's just the end of their time in Maui, and as uh, the babies are now growing, they take them around the island on a swim to get them ready for the long swim about to come to Alaska coming up in a a few months after that, usually around uh, May or June they start leaving for Alaska. So it's a perfect time for whales. It's also an incredible time for weather. You know, we'll get some rain, we'll get lots of sunshine. The wonderful thing about Maui rain is... Is it goes away quickly, and once it's gone, it's like gone, you know, like warm sun and you're dry. So uh, it, it's incredibly private. It's at the end of a very private road, you know, nobody around, just us. It's going to be an amazing experience of soaking up the beauty in terms of the smells, the sounds, the tastes, everything. You're going to, you're going to taste fruits you've never tasted before. Last night, I was listening to the ocean. The, the, the waves are very, very big right now on the North Shore of Maui, and just the crashing of the waves on that. You can actually stand on the edge and feel the land shake as the huge waves crash against the shore. Uh, February often has big waves, too, so, but, but always it has lots and lots of whales. We're limited to 25 people, so join us. Be part of the group. Check out FocusedPassion.com. You'll see the button for the retreat. If you have any questions and want to talk to us personally, leave a phone message at 818-973-3154. Now, that's voicemail, so anytime, 24-7, 818, it's an L.A. number, right? 818-973-3154. And leave a message with your uh, telephone number, area code, your full name, and maybe a, a good time for us to reach you. So we don't have to play phone tag. And we'll answer your questions. And, you know, if you're a subscriber or listening to this show, uh, you know, as it just comes to you, then go to the Send One to the Friend button. And there was a show a few weeks ago called the Maui Paradise Retreat. Anybody you can think of that might be interested in going to this thing, send them the free program. The Michael and I take 45 minutes and discuss this retreat and everything that it has and all that it entails and all the benefits of it. So if you, if you know somebody 
who needs a little bit of paradise right now. They're like, you know, they could really use a little bit of paradise. Then send them the show. Send one to a friend. Uh, send them the show on the Maui Paradise Retreat. Thanks for listening, and we'll look for you in February. Boy, is that going to be exciting, huh? You can just close your eyes and imagine yourself being part of it. And if you do that, as you do that, you can make it happen. This will be a life changer, no question about it. Again, a Walden-like experience. Come and learn to live deliberately. Be gentle, love life, and take care of each other. For Steve Snyder, this is Michael Benner. Aloha from Maui. <laughs>